All right, so I was actually really hoping that I would be back today, and I might be in the building. You might see me, but um, I'm really kind of still struggling a little bit, so I decided to make a couple more lecture videos to get through here. Um, but we will have class on Monday, so just to kind of give you an outline of where we're at here, um, I don't even remember what chapter we're in. Um, well, we're on the chapter which deals with RC and RL circuits. We know that, right? It's like, what, chapter 6, maybe 7? I think it's 7, yeah. Well, you know what chapter it is. Um, so we're talking about RC and RL circuits here. Um, and on the video um, that you watched, or you should have watched on Wednesday, or, well, you didn't have to watch them on Wednesday, you could have watched them any day, um, we did some more examples with RC and RL circuits um, and also did it what happens when you have like more than one resistor, things of that nature, different power supplies, other things of that nature. What I'd like to talk to today um, is we're going to be working on creating a PWM signal. Now, I'm going to first just draw up what a PWM signal is and then what it can be used for. Um, so. I'm going to draw up several PWM signals here, and we're going to talk about the difference between each one of them. And I will go ahead, because this is the way we're going to build our PWM, I'll make it just positive and negative. Oftentimes your PWM signals are just positive voltages, but for now we'll just have it be negative and positive voltages. and this would go on forever. So this would be an example of um, a PWM signal, and this is actually a special type of PWM signal. Um, this PWM signal is just actually a square wave, um, so nothing too exciting going on there, but I'm going to draw a couple others here so we can talk about some of the special features of a PWM signal. So I'll go ahead So here's another PWM signal, and then we'll draw one more. To illustrate this, and the last one here, we'll draw it so that looks like this. So these are all PWM signals that we've drawn here. Now I, I it took my time to draw them carefully um, because I wanted to make sure that I had things. Now just for um, easiness sake we'll just um, say that the time here is in milliseconds for all of these. I set, I suppose easiness would be saying it's in seconds and we'll just say that this is 12 volts and this is negative 12 volts. Um, don't really need these to really understand what's going on but just making the picture a little bit more complete let's have that there. Now a PWM signal um, basically it's something where you can um, me vary the width of the what we call the uh, high value. And so what we can see here is this width here of when it's high or at positive 12 volts, this is 3 milliseconds. And if we look at this one here, the width of this one is 5 milliseconds. And then if we look at this one here, the width of this is 2 milliseconds. And 
that's basically what you do with a PWM signal, is that there's some kind of control, usually maybe just even a potentiometer, that you just um, move left and right, and it varies the width of this high portion. Um, and now we also want to define a couple things here as well, just so we know what these things are in PWM signals. These are all periodic signals, and we should notice that the period for all of these signals is the same. This is 6 milliseconds, the period here is 6 milliseconds, and the period here is 6 milliseconds, which is great. So we have the same period for each, which allows us to um, compute one other thing that's also very important um, in PWM signals. It's something that's called the duty cycle. And there's many ways you could define the duty cycle. Typically, it is the percentage of the period the signal is high. It's typically the percentage of the period that is, um, the signal is high. Um, and one of the reasons why we're interested in this, again, um, there are several applications for this, but let's, before we get into some of those applications, let's go ahead and talk about um, the duty cycle. So it's typically the percentage. Now, there's also negative duty cycle or there's, you know, off duty cycle, things like that, which is percent of time where it's low. But for this first one here, which is the square wave, so I'll just go ahead and label these here, one, two, and three. I'm going to have to scroll down a little bit here. For one, my duty cycle would be, well, it's high for three milliseconds. The period is six milliseconds. So this would be one half, which is 50%. So it's a 50% duty cycle. So one thing you should always think of um, is a 50% duty cycle PWM is just a special case and it's something we call the square wave. Now for figure two here, I need to scroll back up, what did I have here? Five. So the duty cycle would be five milliseconds over six milliseconds, which is just of course five over six which, let me just grab my calculator real quickly here and just give us a decimal approximation of this, which would be 83.3%. Problem three here, or part, picture three, I should say, the duty cycle. Well, this would be two milliseconds over six milliseconds which would be 2 over 6, which of course is 1 third. I always, I don't often write things as percentage, I often just write them as decimals, but percentage that would of course be 33.3%. So a different duty cycle for each one of these. All right, now before we talk about building a circuit, because you might say, why are we talking about this? How does this have to deal with RC circuits? Well, we're going to build this using an RC circuit um, to, to build this um, thing, but we're going to use it in not a standard way that we've talked about in this chapter. So none of this that I'm talking about right now is in the chapter, but I do expect you to know it for this class. We'll probably do a simulation of it and it could show up on an exam. All right, so let's see here. What do we got? Well, why do we use PWMs? Well, one of the most common, and this, these aren't all the applications um, that are out there, but there's just two that come to mind that are very common. Um, DC motor speed control. You can actually use this to control the speed of a simple DC motor. The higher the duty cycle, the faster the motor goes. The lower the duty cycle, the slower the motor goes. And if the duty cycle is too low, the motor won't even spin. 
and the other thing is dimmable LED strips. So if you've ever seen those LED strips, some of you might even own, own them, where you can make all sorts of fancy different colors using a app on your phone or something like that, and you know you can have, or it can cycle through different colors and everything of that nature. Those, um, actually, they're they're just PWM signals. In fact, um, I've had some seniors working on some senior projects before, and they you know got one to s to see how it was working, and they hooked it up to the oscilloscope, and it's it's just a PWM signal and it's quite frankly it's a pretty ugly PWM signal meaning it's not a very clean signal but it's just a PWM signal so those are two applications on why we want to use PWM signals now you'll, you'll talk about PWM signals in f other classes in more detail um, and in the lab next semester you will actually build a circuit that can actually create a PWM circuit um, a PWM signal um, over the course of a couple weeks. All right, so let's get into how we're going to do this. So we need to create a way to um, make it so that we can uh, vary um, the width of that duty cycle there. Now, I could try and get this to like work backwards from the problem but I think what's going to make the most sense is we're just going to take it in stages and then explain how we put these stages together how we end up getting a PWM signal so the first stage is we want to just generate a square wave So we're just going to generate a square wave, or some kind of square wave. It doesn't have to be exactly a square wave, but generate a square wave. And we're going to do that with an op amp. So the op amp circuit that we're going to look at here is the following. And I'm just drawing it here, trying to make sure I don't make any mistakes here. And then, of course, we tie this to, well, let's just say we tie it to 12 volts and negative 12 volts. Now there are ways to make it so that you can go between 12 and ground. Um, you have to be a little bit more sneaky about what you do with these resistors here, uh, but you can do that. Alright, so this is just some capacitor C and some resistor R. Now this is where we're actually going to examine this op amp, not necessarily in the ideal case. You might say, well wait, we've always been assuming these under ideal conditions. But what we're going to want to do here is remember that this output voltage here this output voltage is equal to that large signal voltage gain, remember that was like in the hundreds of thousands, times the difference at of the voltage at the positive terminal minus the voltage at the negative terminal. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at here. That's how we can determine what the output voltage is. Now first off, let's look at this here. I'm going to be probably scrolling back and forth on this just to make you guys aware. Let's look at this node right here. So this node here is, um, well actually I don't need to call it, this is V positive. That's the voltage at the positive. So let's look at what that equation would be here because I'm tying my output back into the positive terminal. Now usually when you tie your output back into the positive terminal like that, and usually you're going to get oscillations. Not always, but usually you'll get oscillations. So that's how we're going to get this oscillating behavior here. In other words, getting our square wave. So we're going to tie that back in. And what we're going to see here is that V plus, just using simple voltage division, would be R2 over R1 
plus R2 times V out. And then if we set R1 equal to R2, we of course just get V out is equal to, I'm sorry, not V out, V plus is equal to V out over 2. So that is what this is fixed at. That voltage is fixed at that point. It's whatever the output voltage is over 2. Now, um, just to warn you here, sometimes my hand is going to bump and it might go to the desktop, so I'll bring it back here because I'm going to start writing over here on the side. Let's see what happens than this negative. So I'm going to have some current and it's going to be coming back through this resistor and I know it can't go into the negative terminal here or very little goes into the negative terminal and so I'm charging up this capacitor. So the voltage at the negative terminal is equal to the voltage across the capacitor and the capacitor we'll assume is initially uncharged. So that means this voltage here is zero volts initially. Now this is where we're going to have to come back to this picture and we're going to erase things and, and draw things again on this. So the capacitor we'll assume is initially uncharged. Then we power up the circuit. We're going to saturate the op amp immediately um, because there's going to be a tiny bit of voltage difference between here. I mean, this we said is uncharged, so there's zero volts on the capacitor. And then there's absolutely going to be some kind of voltage sitting here on the output. It might be close to zero, you know, but it might be 0 0.1. But it, if it's 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 even, you're multiplying that by 100,000 or more. And so suddenly you're going to be saturating the op amp. And we'll just say for simplicity sake for this argument we saturate at 12 volts so I'm going to scroll down here and start um, I'm going to draw a graph here this graph might get a little ugly here um, just to warn you because we're going to try and see what's going on inside this circuit here without writing equations down. Writing equations down and doing that is all great and everything, but oftentimes it's good just to develop an intuitive idea of what's actually happening here um, with the circuitry. Okay, so we said that as soon as we power it on, we're going to saturate at 12 volts. So the red is going to be my output. All right. Well, let's scroll back up here. Um, I will let blue be V plus. So V plus is currently then, of course I made it an odd number, so V plus is going to be sitting right here, halfway at the output. Okay, but then what happens here is this capacitor is going to start charging up because I've got current coming back through this resistor and I'm going to charge that capacitor up. So this capacitor, and I'm going to draw it here in green, initially starts at zero, so this is V minus then, and it's going to start charging up. And I'm going to make that a little bit um, slower scale, so it's going to start charging up here. And meanwhile, this is all still at the voltages that we said they are at. Okay, but then what's going to happen here? 
this green curve is going to get, and I'm going to just draw it a little bit further than I need to, that green curve is going to get above, there, let me erase some of that. that green curve is going to go just a touch above that blue curve. Now as soon as that goes above that blue curve, what do we have here? We have V minus greater than V plus, so V out is now going to be my large signal voltage gain times V plus minus V negative. But this is going to be a negative number. And in fact, it's going to saturate again because of the fact that my large signal voltage gain is so big. So this is going to go to negative 12 volts. So what's going to happen here? Well, right at that point, I'm going to drop right down To negative 12 volts. And so I'm going to sit down there at negative 12 volts now. Well, that also drops down that V positive is now at a negative voltage here. And so what's going to happen now? Well, we're going to sit at these negative voltages. I'm going to draw these out a little bit. But the same game is going to be coming on here. So these are sitting here at these negative voltages. But now what's the capacitor going to do? Well, I've got a negative voltage, so I've got negative current coming back here. So instead of the capacitor charging up to a positive, it's going to be discharging and going negative. So the capacitor is going to start going like this and charging down to a negative. And then as soon as I cross it again, well, now what do I have here? I have that I've got a negative number, but if I subtract a negative number, I'm going to have a positive. And so as soon as I cross that voltage there, I'm going to, again, throw this thing back up to the positive 12. And that throws then the V plus back up to the positive. And then, well, the capacitor now, well, what am I going to do? I'm going to start charging back up. And I'm going to charge back up, and then again, I get above that point, and boom, I saturate back down at negative 12. And so, we can see we just keep playing this game and all I'm doing is railing this op amp between positive and negative 12 by charging and discharging this capacitor. So now notice that there's kind of this setup time here. This doesn't initially have this working like immediately all at once here. There is some time that gets to set us up here. So what we have to do though is we have to figure out, well, how do we, can we determine this period here? So the period here would, let's just say here, let's like say we start like right here and we go to here. So this would be my period. And I'm not going to write the equation down. We can go through and do the math. But just looking back to the circuit here, hmm, what do you think the period is going to have something to do with? Well, it's clearly going to have something to do with this R and C because this R and C time constant, tau, and we're going to have to charge up the capacitor. Now, we're not necessarily fully charging the capacitor. We're only charging it halfway up, or maybe even a third of the way up. So it's not that we're having to do like five taus or something, but it's definitely the period depends on tau. Um, which means the period depends on RC. All right, so this is just the first stage of getting a PWM signal. So we've learned how to create a square wave. 
Okay, so that's enough for this video here. Next step is we're going to turn this square wave into a triangle wave.